Okay, so first of all, thank you for inviting me here. And as uh, Kenneth said already, I apologize for those of you who attended the uh, FOSDEM DevRoom uh, HPC Big Data uh, Data Science Machine Learning Artificial Intelligence Blockchain uh, or whatever I don't remember. Uh, it will be exactly the same talk except for the, well, actually, you don't see it, it's cropped here, but uh, the date is different. But other than that, it will be the same talk. So my name is Damien François, I work in the HPC Center in uh, Louvain-la-Neuve, in Ussé Louvain. And uh, in our HPC Center, we've been seeing the big data world coming at us from far away, but slowly and, sh and slowly coming together. And we've read about convergence, we've heard about convergence of HPC and big data. And uh, as I myself have a background in what we call the time, uh, data mining. I didn't want to be caught by surprise when the convergence would hit us. So I had a look at the whole thing and in the next uh, half an hour or so I will try to give you some insight I gathered on my way to understanding all of this in the context of scientific computing. Because, you know, <clears throat> I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that the scientists, they're never happy. Some of them, they have beautiful equations, they have models, but what they want in the end of the day is to have data. <coughs> Others, they have data, they have lots of data, but what they would like to have is models or beautiful equations. So you might wonder what Shrek is doing here, and maybe you've seen, there was another character in the previous slide, did anyone see where he was? No, it was a dwarf from uh, Snow White. <coughs> uh, do you have any idea why, why, I, why I did that, other than try to use you, no. Because in the literature, actually, people have looked at the type of problems that involve going from data to models or going from models to data. And they gave names to those two types of things, the HPC dwarfs, which are compute intensive, and the big data augers, which are uh, more data intensive. And the thing is, when those dwarfs or augers are too large to fit on a laptop, most of the time, they are moved to bigger machines, either to clusters when it's compute intensive or to uh, clouds in the case of big data. I'm uh, simplifying a bit here, but most of the time, this, this is what you see. And what people like about the clouds is the fact that it's instantly available most of the time, as long as you pay for it. You just request resources and you have access to them already. Uh, people also like the fact that you can go from very low-level self-service management of virtual machines, virtual networks, and so on, up to software as a service where you just click in uh, your web interface and you have <coughs> all uh, possibilities in between. And also a very interesting feature of clouds is the elasticity and the fault tolerance. Resources can grow and shrink depending on exactly what you need at some point in time. So the cloud is really designed for versatility. By contrast, the cluster is more designed for performance. It's most of the time close to the metal, the metal being high hand and specialized hardware, sometimes uh, accelerators and so on. Uh, and also on a cloud system, typically you have an exclusive access to the resources. When you have requested the resources, you might have to wait for some time, but when the time has come, your job has access to exclusive resources. Uh, but more and more, uh, people from both sides have been looking over the fence and see what the people from the other side <coughs> have been enjoying. And so there is a shared interest and there is a convergence of interest from both sides. And we can see that very easily from uh, uh, the, the cloud part because every public cloud provider now has an HPC offer. So the question I am trying to answer is what should an H HPC Academy Center do? Of course, the, the answer is simply to have a look at those cloud or big data technologies and try to make them fit into the cluster. <coughs> so to see how we can merge the cluster and the clouds, we first need to have an a slight overview of what those are. And so here on the right you have the 
the typical cluster stack that consists in high-end hardware, so costly processors, fast networks, fast disks, and so on. On top of which, you have an operating system, classical one, Linux, uh, and you have a stack here that consists, that, that consists typically in a parallel file system and in a parallel computing infrastructure, also like MPI or UPC or PS or something that allows you to program parallel software that it will use several machines at the same time through the network. You have a resource manager, be it Slurm or PBS Pro, HGE, whatever. And then there's a whole HPC user ecosystem on top of that. If you look at the cloud stack, it's a bit more versatile. You see there are more block boxes. The thing is that the hardware is mostly commodity hardware, at least at the beginning. <coughs> The cloud was designed to be run on commodity hardware, not fancy brand uh, hardware, but entry level processors, regular network, and so on. On top of it, you have the operating system, but also another piece which is very important is the hypervisor. It's the one that offers the, vers the versatility at the expense of the performance. And I'm, I'm sure that you know that the cloud typically has three levels of service. The, Infrastructure as a service, the platform as a service, or the uh, software as a service. At the infrastructure level, you play with block storage and virtual machines and virtual networks and so on. At the very top, software as a service, you play with uh, your browser, you just click, and the notion of software is completely uh, decentralized and hidden in a way in the cloud. It's not running on your machine anymore, you just access it with an app, with the web, and you just click and play. And in between, you have something which is quite similar to the HPC stack. You have uh, <coughs> tools to store data, either a distributed file system such as HadoopFS, or all those NoSQL databases that allow you to store data in ways which are uh, especially designed to the application, for the application. And then you have some frameworks to do parallel computing. And on top of that, you have a resource manager that handles all of it. And already you see that if you want to merge those stacks here, this will be a friction point because both in the cloud stack and the, the cluster stack, we have a resource manager that will try to manage the resources and uh, decide how they are used. And then there's a big data ecosystem on top of it. Uh, and if we just zoom in onto the ecosystem, here is the HPC ecosystem and here the big data ecosystem, you see that uh, <clears throat> there are gaps here that we can fill with tools from big data. So it's one more incentive to try to merge the HPC stack and the cluster stack. We can provide more tools to uh, our users. So uh, now I will show you five paths we can follow to try to integrate those HPC cluster technologies and big data uh, cloud technologies. The first one is through uh, virtualization. So with virtualization, if you can put it on your cluster, it will bring to your users more uh, user control, more, more control and more isolation. Uh, it happens a lot that some user asks me for the root password on my uh, HPC cluster because they want to install some weird things that only can be installed with apt-get something. Well, they don't care that you mean installed and apt-get is not installed, but they still want to be able to do something apt-get installed. Um, they want to be in control of the entire environment. Some people, even in the past, have asked me to replace Swarm with PBS because they prefer PBS. So they want really to be in control, and we cannot offer them that if we are just offering bare metal in a schedule and an MPI platform. But with virtualization, you can introduce virtual machines in the in the, the toolkit, and then the users will have more power in what they install in those in those uh, virtual machines. There are three ways we can bring virtualization to an HPC cluster. The first one is to simply have the HPC stack like you have it already uh, right now and uh, deploy software that allow bringing provisioning virtual machines inside 
uh, job allocations and a tool that does this for instance is pickup and these are links actually I can't click for you on, on them on the screen but if you have access to the slides uh, you'll have the references behind here so it's possible to uh, submit a job which is not a bash script but a virtual machine and a virtual machine and have the virtual machine run uh, in the job allocation. Another way of bringing virtualization to the cluster is working the other way around, is destroying completely the HPC stack and replacing it with a cloud stack, for instance, with OpenStack or OpenNebula. So you install the cloud stack and you deploy virtual machines in which you install the HPC stack. A tool that we use to do that is called Trinity X. It is based on OpenStack, it's open source, and it really allows you to create virtual clusters with the front end or login nodes that are um, virtual machine, <coughs> and the compute nodes in those virtual clusters are uh, Docker, Docker instances. This brings me to the third way of <coughs> introducing virtualization in a cluster, in the HPC cluster, is through containers. So containers, right now in HPC, are very popular. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about Singularity or Shifter or Child Cloud. Uh, so the container is a, is a kind of virtual machine, but it's more lightweight, consumes less resources, has less over, overhead. So it's very suited for HPC. And it allows the user to install its own operating system as long as uh, it's compatible with the OS operating system. So it has the same. Oops, I'm sorry. And the same, it uses the same kernel. Uh, it's the, an easy way for an HPC administrator to offer virtualization to poor uh, users. So these are three ways we can bring virtualization to the cluster and with virtualization bringing more power, more user control. Another way we can use a cluster in a HPC context is named cloud bursting. And the idea here is to uh, enlarge an HPC cluster with resources coming from a cloud, either a public cloud or a private cloud, it doesn't matter. Uh, every scheduler or resource manager in the HPC world has this notion of elastic compute or uh, burst bursting or whatever. Uh, so you can define in advance a set of compute nodes which are <coughs> not physically on premises but are defined in, in the cloud and you can activate them or deactivate them depending on the load on your cluster. When you have surges or big peaks of demand and you don't want the, the queue to fill up, you can activate um, virtual machines in the cloud to take part of this load on, the, on your cluster. Third thing you can do to bring more big data like technologies to your cluster is to offer additional storage parity. Most of the time a cluster just has file systems. It may have three or four different file systems, but the main storage system on a cluster is a file. It's working at the file level. Which sometimes cannot be more uh, the, the most appropriate storage. Many times the clusters are designed to hold very large files. But sometimes we have users who do not have large files, they just have zillions of tiny files. It's called the ZOP problem in the literature. So they literally come with millions or billions of 1K or 2K files residing on a file system. <coughs> Sorry, that was designed to uh, have massive files. And so they end up actually consuming more space in the data in the metadata part of the file system than in the actual data part of the file system. And so what you can do is try to have those users move from using files to some other type of storage. Other type of storage that can be object storage, such as HDFS, which is the basis for MapReduce and so on, uh, <coughs> but also Swift or Ceph. Uh, which you can either install on a dedicated set of uh, hardware very close to your cluster, or you can even think of using the hard drives in your compute nodes to install the HDFS or the set. Uh, because most of the time, when compute nodes have a disk, 
in a compute cluster, uh, they just the disk just holds the operating system and it does nothing and no interesting jobs. So if you can gather them and offer them as a, a centralized HDFS, for instance, uh, it can work and it can be beneficial for you for the users. Another way to offer uh, HDFS without having to actually install it is to put a connector on top of your Parallel system. So, <coughs> nearly every Parallel system I just mentioned here some uh, on clusters now have a what they call most of the time a Hadoop connector that allows using the Parallel system as if it were an HDFS to the user that has their map reduce of spike job. There's no difference uh, except that it's not HDFS running behind, but it's either Gluster or Gluster or uh, VGFS or whatever. And then another way you can uh, try to make things better is to offer your users NoSQL databases, access to NoSQL databases. So you can uh, dedicate some nodes in your cluster to run, for instance, an elastic search and try to have your users that write texts a lot, put all their text <coughs> in the elastic search rather than in 1K files on the file system. Uh, there are other type of NoSQL databases. Elastic search is very good for texts. Uh, MongoDB is very good for documents. Cassandra is very good for matrices. And FlexDB is very good for time series. And uh, Neo4j is very good for or is designed for graphs. So if you can try to convince your users that have data that fit better on a NoSQL store, uh, then you can relieve the burden on the Parify system and try to leave the Parify system for those big massive files that uh, come from the simulation and so on. So this is <coughs> adding additional storage to your compute to your HPC center. What you can also do is bring additional programming paradigm. Typically, in an HPC cluster, you have an MPI platform. This is uh, one way to write product programs. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum of product programming, you have job arrays, with, which are embarrassingly parallel. And in between, in the HPC world, there is nothing really. But the tools from Big Data actually they fit in between, I believe. So, <coughs> Uh, MapReduce and Spark offer new ways of writing parallel program that work that can work well on a, on a cluster, uh, and you can do that several ways. Both MapReduce or Spark have a standard mode, standard mode, so you can just tell your users, okay, uh, take care of it yourself. I don't want to know what you're doing with my cluster. If you want to do big data on my cluster, I don't want to know. So you can answer them that. It's not very user friendly, and you will uh, push people away from your HPC center to the actual clouds. So what you can do is install tools such as MapDoop, which are which is a framework for, for design for deploying an, a Doop uh, framework within an, an allocation. So it's a set of scripts that you can help your user with to put in their submission script, and when the job is submitted. It will install an HDFS and what, everything that is needed for a Spark or a, a, a MapReduce job to start inside a job allocation. You can also try to disguise your HPC cluster as a Hadoop platform or as a Spark platform by using tools such as anything on the Mac, <coughs> you know, over here, or Ham or MacPy. <coughs> Those are tools that actually offer a Hadoop interface, but use the uh, scheduler from the HPC cluster stack. And they just translate on the fly the requests for resources from the uh, big data type of computations onto the, what the, the scheduler can offer. Then you can try to do a collocation of both a scheduler for big data and HPC. I said earlier that both the HPC stack and the big data stack, they have a resource manager and that it can be a friction point. And actually, you can 
uh, <coughs> smooth things of it by just having your HPC scheduler working like usual and having the VData scheduler just take care of the nodes that are left idle by the HPC scheduler. Because the nice thing about MapReduce and Spark and so on is the resilience and it's the common thing to many cloud authors. Uh, the fact that if a node disappears in a Yarn or in Mesos a cluster, it doesn't harm too much. It will slow things down, but it will not crush everything. So you can uh, <coughs> think about just including bits of code in the uh, prologue and epilogue of your jobs in the cluster to inform Yarn on Mes or Mesos that the set of resources has increased for instance, when a job is uh, finished or decreased, when a job is starting or when a job is uh, when a, a job is finished. And actually, here I link to a study uh, where people have tried to quanti quantify uh, how efficient that can be, and they've shown that it, of course, is a bit less efficient in both parts of the uh, of the equation. So HPC jobs have a bit less throughput and uh, yarn jobs uh, are a bit less efficient but the total usage time of the cluster can be dramatically increased simply because you have uh, more time of uh, jobs that can be run on the system. And then of course the, uh, <coughs> the long-term goal is to have a unified big data HPC stack. Uh, there are some actors working on this uh, the thing is that <clears throat> most of the time what you see on the web is nice slideshows about what they are doing but you never can find the source code or you can <coughs> never find the download page. So we might have to develop that by ourselves. So I've been talking here about additional program programming paddings that you can bring from the cloud or big data world into your cluster. And the fifth, fifth point uh, I wanted to talk about is web and apps because I don't know why, because I love SSH, I love the terminal, I love my command line, but many users know are getting afraid of using the keyboard. If it's not a touch screen that you can click on, it scares them away. I don't know why, but it's uh, the case. So you might at some point have to give your user another entry point than the command line interface and the, the keyboard world. What you can do is uh, install um, <coughs> web interfaces that uh, users can use to submit jobs. Many schedulers have other third-party options or it's built in the option to have a web interface to the scheduler where the user can just click on the resources they need and describe their job and then click on submit and they, are, uh, so, uh, they have their job submitted on the cluster. But you can also uh, <coughs> deploy tools such as RStudio or Jupyter that allows you to run interactively R programs or Python programs or Scala programs or whatever directly on the cluster while staying inside a very reassuring web interface and not the black command line. The same holds for the data because <coughs> the users nowadays, when they are uh, a bit young, they like to have everything controlled from their uh, phone or <coughs> from the web. And the idea of using rsync or SCP to copy your fetch file from the cluster can be very frustrating to them. So if you are able to give them a Dropbox-like access to their data on the cluster, most of the time they are very happy. And so tools such as Nextcloud or OnCloud uh, are very easy to install and they really increase the user experience in terms of accessing the data, moni monitoring files and having uh, ubiquitous access to the data, whether in the train or at home on their phone. They know exactly what their files are on the cluster and they can uh, peek inside the, the files and see, for instance, in the logs where the job <coughs> here, here is going. So there are five uh, ways I just showed and if we put them together we have a structure like this for the uh, ultimate uh, cluster or ultimate cloud uh, <coughs> where you have a fast interconnect 
which is uh, mostly imperative. And then three types typically of compute nodes, ones with very fast compute, one with very fast network uh, uh, storage, and others with very large memory. If you have these three types of hardware, you can accommodate nearly any HPC or B data workflow in there or there. And then you will still need a parallel file system, but you will need to have on top of it a Hadoop connector. And those people coming from HPC, they will just use the parallel file system just the, the way they like to, to use it. And those who come from the Hadoop world will just tell them, okay, use the Hadoop connector on top of my uh, BGFS, for instance, and it should work for them. Then you should uh, have some nodes uh, dedicated to databases, to NoSQL databases, be it Elasticsearch or MongoDB or whatever, uh, and try to pinpoint the users that are generating those millions or trillions small files on your on your cluster. You can try to have them migrate their data to those kind of databases. Most of the time, it will be there will be friction. They will not want to do it. But if they do it, in the end, their application will be much faster because there will be much less weight on the file system. And <coughs> in the end, the total usability of the cluster will be increased. Of course, you have management nodes, but what's important is that you can have three types of input output nodes. The typical login nodes, as the users know it, now going through SSH. Uh, except that you want to configure it and configure the cluster in a way that those nodes can accept typical uh, batch jobs, but also can accept virtual machines or containers or MapReduce or Spark jobs. And then you will have the web nodes where the users will uh, be able to submit jobs or to use uh, RStudio or Jupyter to uh, interactively, interactively use the resources of the cluster inside their um, uh, IDE, so their integrated development environment. And then you will have, you will have transfer nodes that uh, run the typical HPC stuff, such as GridFTP or iRuts, but also Nextcloud to have this proper class interface to your cluster, or the tools from Edu that are uh, part of the uh, data transfer machinery, such as Scoop and so on. And, well, if you are able to create this, I think that in the end, the scientists, uh, they will be there. Thank you for your attention. Do you have questions? Yes. Which of those things have you already? <laughs> he asked me the same question yesterday. No. So, no. Somebody else did. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, at this point in time, we have all the we have all the we have all the bricks, but not in the same machine. So we have clusters, we have uh, OpenStack, we have uh, machines with uh, RStudio, we have machines with uh, Nextcloud, and actually Nextcloud is hooked up to our cluster. We have uh, we have an Elasticsearch uh, uh, cluster. We have a MariaDB cluster, so we have bits everywhere, but we, we still need to do the job of integrating everything together and uh, trying really to offer a single machine to everyone. Yes? How many user requests you have for all these technologies? How many? User requests. So how many users are willing to use data science in your cluster? It's difficult to estimate because most of the time one guy come, comes at us and we say we are sorry we cannot answer right now and it says that to his friends right, yeah. and all of a sudden we have a whole lab or a whole department that will not come at us um, but we had sufficiently enough requests that we could not honor to have them think about what we need to do to keep uh, being a resource in the university and not being only labeled as those guys which are useless, uh, useful for uh, CFD but useless for anything else. So something like 10 requests a year. So it might seem not uh, a large number, but they come from people who never used HPC before. So there are new publics that we try to capture in our um, 
centers so that we try more and more to move from the HPC center to the scientific computing center. More questions? Okay, thank you very much.